breathing and exchange of gases. As you have read earlier, organisms utilize oxygen to break down indirectly the nutrient molecules like glucose and to derive energy to perform various activities. During the above catabolic reactions, carbon dioxide, which is harmful, is also released. Hence, it is evident that carbon dioxide produced by the cells have to be released out and oxygen has to be continuously provided to the cells. Breathing commonly known as respiration is a process of exchange of oxygen from the atmosphere with carbon dioxide produced by the cells. Respiratory organs. Depending mainly on their habitats, the level of organization mechanisms of breathing vary among different groups of animals. By simple diffusion, lower invertebrates exchange oxygen with carbon dioxide over their entire body surface. Example sponges, cylindrates, flatworms, etc. Within the body, earthworms use their moist cuticle and insects have a network of tubes to transport atmospheric air. Gills that are special vascularized structures are used by most of the aquatic arthropods and mollusks whereas lungs that are vascularized bags are used by the terrestrial forms for the exchange of gases. Among vertebrates for respiration, fishes use gills, whereas reptiles, birds and mammals use lungs. Amphibians can respire through their moist skin also, example frogs. A well-developed respiratory system is present in mammals. Human Respiratory System Human beings have a pair of external nostrils opening out above the upper lips. Through the nasal passage, it leads to a nasal chamber. The nasal chamber opens into a portion of pharynx called nasopharynx, a common passage for food and air. Nasopharynx opens through glottis of the larynx region into the trachea. Larynx, also called the sound box, is a cartilaginous box which helps in sound production. During swallowing, a thin elastic cartilaginous flap called epiglottis covers the glottis to prevent the entry of food into the larynx. Trachea extending up to the mid-thoracic cavity is a straight tube which divides at the level of fifth thoracic vertebra into the right and left primary bronchi. Each bronchi forms the secondary and tertiary bronchi and bronchioles by repeated divisions ending up in very thin terminal bronchi. Incomplete cartilaginous rings support the trachea, primary, secondary and tertiary bronchi and initial bronchioles. Each terminal bronchiole gives rise to alveoli which are a number of very thin, irregular, walled and vascularized bag-like structures. The lungs comprise of branching network of bronchi, bronchioles and alveoli. The two lungs of human beings are covered by a double membrane pleura with pleural fluid between them. On the lung surface, it reduces friction. The thoracic lining is in close contact with the outer pleural membrane whereas the inner pleural membrane is in contact with the lung surface. The conducting part constitute the part starting with the external nostrils up to the terminal bronchioles whereas the respiratory or exchange part of the respiratory system are the alveoli and their ducts. The atmospheric air is transported to the alveoli by the conducting part which also clears it from foreign particles, humidifies and also brings the air to body temperature. The site of actual diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide between blood and atmospheric air is the exchange part. 
The thoracic chamber is anatomically an airtight chamber where the lungs are situated. The thoracic chamber is formed dorsally by the vertebral column, ventrally by the sternum, laterally by the ribs and on the lower side by the dome-shaped diaphragm. In the thorax, the anatomical setup of lungs is such that any change in the volume of the thoracic cavity will be reflected in the lung cavity. Since we cannot directly alter the pulmonary volume, such an arrangement is essential for breathing. Location of heart in thoracic cavity Respiration involves 1. Breathing or pulmonary ventilation in which atmospheric air is drawn in and carbon dioxide rich alveolar air is released out. 2. Diffusion of gases across alveolar membrane. 3. Transport of gases by the blood. 4. Diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide between blood and tissues. 5. Utilization of oxygen by the cells for catabolic reactions and resultant release of carbon dioxide. Mechanism of breathing. Breathing involves two stages. The atmospheric air is drawn in called inspiration and the alveolar air is released out called expiration. A pressure gradient is created between the lungs and the atmosphere by the movement of air into and out of the lungs. If the pressure within the lungs is less than the atmospheric pressure, inspiration can occur. That is, with respect to atmospheric pressure, there is a negative pressure in the lungs. Similarly, when the intrapulmonary pressure is higher than the atmospheric pressure, expiration takes place. Such gradients are generated by the diaphragm and a specialized set of muscles, external and internal intercostals between the ribs. The contraction of diaphragm initiates inspiration, which is the anteroposterior axis, increases the volume of thoracic chamber. The ribs are lifted up when external intercostal muscles and the sternum are contracted, causing an increase in the volume of the thoracic chamber in the dorsoventral axis. A similar increase in pulmonary volume is caused by the overall increase in the thoracic volume. The air from outside is forced to move into the lungs, that is, inspiration, when an increase in pulmonary volume decreases the intrapulmonary pressure to less than atmospheric pressure. When the diaphragm relaxes, the intercostal muscles returns the diaphragm and sternum to their normal positions and the thoracic volume is reduced and thereby the pulmonary volume. This causes the intrapulmonary pressure to increase slightly above the atmospheric pressure, resulting in the expulsion of air from the lungs, that is, expiration. With the help of additional muscles in the abdomen, we have the ability to increase the strength of inspiration and expiration. A healthy human, on an average, breathes 12 to 16 times per minute. A spirometer can be used to estimate the volume of air involved in breathing movements, which helps in clinical assessment of pulmonary functions. Respiratory Volumes and Capacities Tidal Volume During a normal respiration, volume of air inspired or expired. It is approximately 500 ml, that is, per minute, a healthy man can respire or expire approximately 6,000 to 8,000 ml of air. Inspiratory Reserve Volume by a forcible inspiration, additional volume of air a person can inspire. This averages 2,500 ml to 3,000 ml. Expiratory reserve volume. By a forcible expiration, additional volume of air a person can expire. This averages 1,000 ml to 1,100 ml. 
residual volume even after a forcible expiration volume of air remaining in the lungs this averages 1100 ml to 1200 ml one can derive various pulmonary capacities by adding up a few respiratory volumes described above which can be used in clinical diagnosis inspiratory capacity after a normal expiration total volume of air a person can inspire this includes tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume expiratory capacity after a normal inspiration total volume of air a person can expire this includes tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume functional residual capacity after a normal expiration volume of air that will remain in the lungs this includes erv plus rv vital capacity after a forced expiration the maximum volume of air a person can breathe in this includes erv tv and irv or after a forced inspiration the maximum volume of air a person can breathe out total lung capacity at the end of a forced inspiration total volume of air accommodated in the lungs this indicates rv erv tv and irv or vital capacity plus residual volume exchange of gases alveoli are the primary sites of exchange of gases exchange of gases between blood and tissues also occur in these sites oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged by simple diffusion mainly based on pressure or concentration gradient the thickness of the membranes as well as the solubility of gases involved in diffusion are also some important factors that can affect the rate of diffusion in a mixture of gases pressure contributed by an individual gas is called partial pressure and is represented as po2 for oxygen and pco2 for carbon dioxide in the table the data given clearly indicates a concentration gradient for oxygen from alveoli to blood and blood to tissues diagrammatic representation of exchange of gases at the alveolus and the body tissue with blood and transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide Similarly in the opposite direction a gradient is present for carbon dioxide that is from tissues to blood and blood to alveoli as the solubility of carbon dioxide is higher than that of oxygen 20 to 25 times through the diffusion membrane the amount of carbon dioxide that can diffuse per unit difference in partial pressure is u is much higher compared to that of oxygen the three major layers Layers, the diffusion membrane is made up of are the thin squamous epithelium of alveoli, the endothelium of alveolar capillaries, and the basement substance in between them. However, much less than a millimeter is its total thickness. All the factors in our body are therefore favorable for diffusion of oxygen from alveoli to tissues and that of carbon dioxide from tissues to alveoli. Transport of gases for oxygen and carbon dioxide, blood is the medium of transport. In the blood, about 97% of oxygen is transported by RBCs. In, an, in a dissolved state, 3% of the remaining oxygen is carried through the plasma. By RBCs, nearly 20 to 25% of carbon dioxide is transported, whereas as bicarbonate, 70% of it is carried. In a dissolved state, about 7% of carbon dioxide is carried through plasma. Transport of oxygen. In the RBCs, hemoglobin is present, which is a red-colored iron-containing pigment. 
in a reversible manner oxygen can bind with hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin each molecule of hemoglobin can carry a maximum of four oxygen molecules binding of oxygen with hemoglobin is related primarily to partial pressure of oxygen the other factors which can interfere with this binding are partial pressure of carbon dioxide, hydrogen, ion concentration and temperature. When percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen is plotted against the PO2, a sigmoid curve is obtained. The curve thus obtained is called the oxygen dissociation curve and is highly useful in studying the effect of factors like PCO2, H+, concentration, etc. on binding of O2 with hemoglobin. The factors that are favorable for the formation of oxyhemoglobin in the alveoli are high PO2, low PCO2, lesser hydrogen ion concentration and lower temperature, whereas the conditions that are favorable for dissociation of oxygen from oxyhemoglobin in the tissues are low PO2, high PCO2, high H plus concentration and a uh, higher temperature. This clearly indicates that in the lung surface, oxygen gets bound to hemoglobin and gets dissociated at the tissues. Under normal physiological conditions, every 100 ml of oxygenated blood can deliver around 5 ml of oxygen to the tissues. Transport of carbon dioxide. Hemoglobin carries carbon dioxide as carbamino hemoglobin. This binding is related to the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. A major factor which could affect this binding is PO2. In the tissues, when PCO2 is high and PO2 is low, more binding of carbon dioxide occurs whereas in the alveoli, when the PCO2 is low and PO2 is high, dissociation of carbon dioxide from carbamino hemoglobin takes place. That is from the tissues, CO2 which is bound to hemoglobin is delivered at the alveoli. A very high concentration of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase is present in RBCs and in the plasma too, minute quantities of the same is present. In both directions, this enzyme facilitates the following reaction. At the tissue side, due to catabolism, where partial pressure of carbon dioxide is high, carbon dioxide diffuses into blood and forms HCO3- and hydrogen ion. Where PCO2 is low, at the alveolar side, the reaction proceeds in the opposite direction, leading to the formation of carbon dioxide and water. Thus, at the tissue level, carbon dioxide trapped as bicarbonate and transported to the alveoli is released out as carbon dioxide. Approximately 4 ml of carbon dioxide is delivered for every 100 ml of deoxygenated blood to the alveoli. Regulation of respiration. Human beings to suit the demands of the body tissues have a significant ability to maintain and moderate the respiratory rhythm. This is done by the neural system. A specialized center called respiratory rhythm center present in the medulla region of the brain is primarily responsible for this regulation. Another center called NIM pneumotaxic center present in the pons region of the brain can moderate the functions of the respiratory rhythm center. From this center, neural signal can reduce the duration of inspiration and thereby alter the respiratory rate. Adjacent to the rhythm center, a chemosensitive area is situated which is highly sensitive to carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions.
this center can be activated with increase in these substances which in turn can signal the rhythm center to make necessary adjustments in the respiratory process by which these substances can be eliminated. In aortic arch, the carotid artery receptors associated can also recognize changes in carbon dioxide and hydrogen ion concentration and send necessary signals for remedial actions to the rhythm center. The role of oxygen is quite insignificant in the regulation of respiratory rhythm. Disorders of respiratory system Asthma due to inflammation of bronchi and bronchioles is a difficulty in breathing and causes wheezing. Emphysema is a chronic disorder in which respiratory surface is decreased due to the damage in the alveolar walls. Cigarette smoking is one of the major causes of this. Occupational respiratory disorders, especially in certain industries involving grinding or stone breaking, so much dust is produced that the defense mechanism of the body cannot fully cope with the situation. Long exposure can give rise to inflammation leading to fibrosis and thus causing serious lung damage. Protective masks should be worn by workers in such industries. Thank you so much for watching. Please share this video with your friends. Leave your comments below and please subscribe to my channel for more content. Click that bell notification that would let you know when a new video is uploaded. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, please subscribe to my channel for more content. For more videos, please check the description box down below.